In this post-apocalyptic world, homeowners in our community have no choice but to grow crops under 10 meters of snow. Yet, some guys shamelessly live with their girlfriends at home. Even though I recently managed to resolve a negotiation crisis perfectly, I know deep down that having Wang Chong and Wan Tinfong as my teammates isn't enough. Li Kian and Xin Yuling are smart, they knew. If you've missed any previous chapters, the link is in the description below. Be sure to catch up. Alright folks, let's set our sights high today, our goal is 500 likes. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. The negotiation terms because of my firepower. They'll surely resist again when the time is right. Uncle Yu, standing beside me, chuckled and said, Are you asking them to plant corn in this cold weather, Zhang Yi? Are you messing with them? I just smiled and replied, I'm just draining their energy. Most people nowadays are starving and can hardly get enough food. Even if they wanted to resist in the future, they wouldn't have the strength to do so. I looked at Uncle Yu seriously and said, No one else should know about our conversation today. We'll stick to the plan. We not only need to watch out for outsiders but also be cautious of insiders betraying us in this building. Uncle Yu nodded in agreement and assured me, Don't worry, Zhang Yi. I'll follow your lead. My family and I depend on you. After our discussion, I returned to my safe house. Dr. Zhou was doing yoga in the bedroom, and her face lit up when she saw me. Is everything okay? How did the negotiations go? She asked. Without saying a word, I reassured her, nothing serious. Just had to use a few tactics, and they conceded. It might be a bit unsafe outside for a while, so just stay home. Give it some time, and these annoying folks will be gone for good. Hearing this, Dr. Joe took on a concerned expression and reminded me to be careful too. The next morning, a large group of homeowners gathered in front of Unit 25, desperate for a meal. They put all their energy into farming while my two teammates supervised their work. Just as I walked out from the building's entrance, Wan Chong and Wan Tinfong looked excited. Hey, Zhang Yi, are you going out to scavenge? Why not take us along? We're just hanging around here anyway, they said eagerly. I flashed them a smile. My snowmobile can't fit that many people. It's better to use the space for more supplies. You two just stay put, and I'll be back soon, I replied. Then, I turned to the workers and added, make sure you're putting in the effort. I'll be checking on your progress when I get back. If it's not up to scratch, there won't be any food. With that, I set off. But as I left, I overheard Wen Chong and Huang Tinfong whispering to each other. They were scheming to get their hands on my vehicle. My first stop wasn't to search for food, but rather to swing by the Tianhai City Pet Hospital. I rifled through the pharmacy and, within minutes, found a whole box of rat poison. Normally used to put down sick pets, this poison, when diluted, is colorless and tasteless. It was perfect for giving those shameless folks a little vitamin boost. If I wasn't worried about them causing chaos, I wouldn't even bother providing food for three, let alone 300. Everyone should fend for themselves in this post-apocalyptic world. Why should I play the saint? This was the perfect opportunity to send them off. I still need to keep up appearances for the sake of the community, so I went out to scavenge for supplies in the city. When I returned with bags full of provisions, my neighbors were shocked. Zhang Yi, where did you find all these supplies? They asked. I just grinned and replied, with the snow piling up outside, it's getting tougher to find what we need. I guess I got lucky this time, but who knows about next time. Then, I used my phone to let the other unit owners know they could come and collect their share of today's food. Surprisingly, they were all more cautious now, sending only one representative each. It was clear they were afraid I might do something drastic. After that, I distributed the food, starting with the first unit's representative. Once everything was handed out, I smiled and said, we're all part of the same community here. Let's not be strangers. From now on, let's work together towards a better future. Of course, I said this to lower their guard, and as expected, everyone became emotional. Zhang Yi is right. As long as we work together, we can get through this, I stated, clapping my hands to interrupt their cheers. Now that the food has been distributed, everyone can go back, eat well, and prepare to farm diligently tomorrow, I announced. Upon hearing this, the neighbors left joyfully. However, I watched their retreating figures and chuckled coldly. In a little while, these troublemakers will be gone for good, I thought to myself. I then returned to my safe house, instructed that to prepare dinner, and headed to the bathroom for a relaxing hot shower. After getting rid of these problematic individuals, I'll need to find a safer place to start anew. Each representative, after collecting their food, immediately returned to their respective buildings. Seeing his underling return with food, Wan Chong instantly became ecstatic. Ignoring the questions from his subordinate, he eagerly searched through the food. Soon, Wang Chun found a brand new, unopened pack of cigarettes. Yo, Zhang Yi truly keeps his word, 
Wang Chun exclaimed, causing the younger gang members behind him to become restless. Brother Chan, give us one too. We can't take it anymore, we're suffocating, they pleaded. Seeing the situation, Wang Chong reluctantly handed out a cigarette to each of his underlings, tears welling up in his eyes as he watched them joyously smoke. Wang Chong felt compelled to distribute the cigarettes, fearing it would jeopardize his leadership position if he didn't. He then gathered the food and called for all the brothers to come and distribute it. A group of underlings was already eating in the living room, which eased Wen Chong's worries, he thought Zhang Yi hadn't poisoned the food. Living off others while doing nothing seemed like a decent life to them, all they had to do was let the deceived homeowners keep working. Meanwhile, the homeowners, believing in the promised food distribution, worked enthusiastically. However, after a day's work, they received nothing. Arguments erupted in every building in the community, they said we'd get food if we worked. Why do we have nothing after a whole day's labor? The unit owners retorted, you slack off all day and then expect food? Where does that happen? The constant quarreling throughout the community woke me from my sleep, but this scene was exactly what I wanted to witness. Once they settled their internal disputes, it would be time for me to take action. After breakfast, I left early. First, I found Uncle Yu and warned him about the impending riots due to uneven food distribution. I urged them to be careful. Then, I rode my snowmobile to search for supplies, aiming to intensify their internal conflicts. Unfortunately, I brought back even less food than before. With a smile, I said, supplies are getting harder to find outside. Please make do with what we have today. I'll try to find more tomorrow. As I predicted, riots broke out in the entire community that night. Desperate for a meal, some homeowners turned against their longtime neighbors, resorting to violence. Shockingly, some even pushed others off high-rise buildings to alleviate the pressure of food distribution. The neighbors who didn't get food had completely lost their minds. The community had become more chaotic than ever, with the cries of fighting and killing echoing everywhere. Yet, I was at home, leisurely listening to classical music, wondering how many would die that night. The next morning, I walked out of the building with Uncle Yu and a few others. Though mentally prepared, the scene still took my breath away. Hundreds of bodies were strewn haphazardly around the community, and the surrounding buildings were stained with blackened, congealed blood. It was clear how intense the riot had been the night before. The expressions of agony on their faces suggested many were forced to jump from tall buildings, only to freeze to death in the cold night. Uncle Yu approached me and asked, do we still need to work today? I smiled, why wouldn't we? I pointed to a corpse nearby. Did you really think of me as a saint? I'm not obliged to support you all. If you want food, you have to work for it. I gestured at the bodies on the ground. Of course, if you end up like this, you won't have to work anymore. Hearing this, the group looked shocked. Compared to those who had died, they felt incredibly lucky. At least they didn't have to fight others for a bite to eat. Thinking this, they immediately turned around, indicating their readiness to work. Uncle Yu, looking at the bodies scattered around, asked, do we need to call out people from other buildings to work? I just smiled. They probably don't have the time for that now. This riot is just the beginning. Unless the building owners can perfectly solve the food distribution issue, one side will eventually perish. All we have to do now is wait for their internal depletion. Later, I messaged the building owners negotiation group, stating that if I didn't see people from all the buildings working the next day, I couldn't guarantee food and cigarettes. Indeed, after making that stern declaration, the community was bustling again early in the morning. A large number of people began to cultivate and farm. However, compared to previous days, the number of workers had decreased by a third. Seeing this, Uncle Yu looked puzzled. They know they might not get any food. Why are they working so hard? I glanced at two men who were moving bodies and smiled. Aren't they addressing the food issue right now? Besides, people are always driven by their interests. Working gives them hope for survival, while rebelling is uncertain. I was about to leave to search for supplies when Lingling Ling stopped me. Zhang Yi, wait. I want to discuss a potential collaboration. Lingling Ling knew that if things continued in this manner, the community would eventually collapse. She approached me with a proposal for continued cooperation, understanding that unless the food distribution issue was resolved, the casualties would only increase. She believed she could use scientific management methods to help me govern the community and even expand our territory, establishing a new kingdom in this post-apocalyptic world. However, I just laughed. This current situation is exactly what I wanted to see. And now you expect me to play the generous king and provide for these 2,000 people for nothing? I grabbed Ling Ling's shoulder. Before the apocalypse, you use this rhetoric to deceive many people into collaborating with you. By now, the grass on their graves must be really tall. Do you really think I'm dumb enough to be your next victim? I pushed Ling Ling away. I'm not interested in any of your plans. Find someone else to play your emperor. Seeing that I wasn't falling for her proposal, 
Lingling pleaded, Zhang Yi, please reconsider. I promise I'll be a good advisor. On the other hand, Li Chen was diligently leading his team to clear and cultivate the land. To my surprise, none of Li Jin's team had suffered any casualties so far. This guy surely had some skills. Seeing me, Li Jin exclaimed, Zhang Yi, what brings you here? I replied with a smile, I'm curious about how you manage your building. The other units have started fighting among themselves over food distribution. Li Jin didn't hide much and shared that he had informed everyone about the negotiation results from the start. No matter what happened later, the food would be distributed equally. I strongly disagreed with this approach. You think you're so clever, but if you continue this way, everyone will starve. With your capabilities, you could have chosen and protected the most useful people and abandoned the rest. You're always trying to be the saint, even in this post-apocalyptic world where you can't save everyone. It's your own fault, I didn't wait for his response and just left, feeling weighed down by the heavy burden. I knew the apocalypse tested human nature, but I struggled with my own moral dilemma. Wang Chong and Huang Tian Farm approached me. Bro, aren't you going out to find food today? Wang Chong asked eagerly. I smiled. Be patient. I'm about to head out, and we'll make sure to get some good cigarettes and liquor for you guys. The two brothers were visibly excited. We always knew you were loyal, Zhang Yi. You're our savior in this world. Our lives are in your hands now. I chuckled. Come on, from now on, we're all brothers in this post-apocalyptic world. I'll do my best to provide for everyone. As usual, I distributed food to the representatives of each building. But then, several building owners who had been hiding approached me. Brother Zhang Yi, you can't play favorites. Next time, could you also bring us some cigarettes? We won't trouble you. Just one pack a day will do, they said shamelessly. Faced with these shameless owners, I reluctantly agreed, promising to provide for them starting tomorrow. With my affirmative answer, the group left contentedly. However, two neighbors who witnessed the scene expressed their discontent. These guys are going too far. You already generously provide them with food, Zhang Yi, and now they want cigarettes too? If they're asking for cigarettes today, tomorrow they'll be demanding liquor, one of them remarked. I just smiled. They're right. I shouldn't play favorites. The two stood there stunned. They never expected someone as ruthless as me to be so amenable. But then, jealousy consumed them. They toiled 18 hours a day just to barely get by, so why did these building owners deserve cigarettes afterwards? I went back home, sinking into my couch, pondering my next moves. After the recent chaos that left over half of the community either dead or injured, I knew things couldn't continue like this. It was time to confront these people. The next day, I raided a supermarket for supplies, planning to give them a lavish last meal before sending them off. I laced all the food with rat poison, knowing even a small bite would be deadly. But despite my preparations, I felt uneasy. Despite providing food every day, it was never enough. Only the building owners asked for extras like cigarettes. Could they be plotting something too? But as I thought about my safe house and weapons, I felt a bit more confident. No scheme could beat overwhelming firepower. I returned to the community with heaps of supplies, only to find Uncle Yu and his group waiting. I notified the building representatives to collect their food, smirking internally at their unsuspecting fate. As I handed out the poisoned food, more than half of the building owners surprisingly showed up in person, enticed by cigarettes and liquor. But just as I was about to distribute the food, Wang Chong shouted and pulled out a gun, aiming it at me. Damn it, I had let my guard down. But in the nick of time, Uncle Yu shielded me, taking three bullets. I rushed to grab Uncle Yu, who had fallen, and yelled at Wong Chong and the others, demanding to know what they thought they were doing. Just then, a spy hidden in Building 25 finally revealed himself, swinging a shovel at me. Reacting swiftly, I pulled out a submachine gun from my pocket and warned him that if he wanted to die, I'd be happy to oblige. I opened fire, hitting several in the front row, causing panic among the crowd behind. They shouted that I had a submachine gun, but I didn't hesitate, using my sharp shooting skills to take out almost everyone in the room. After emptying my submachine gun, I pulled out two handguns from my pocket, declaring that it was too late for them to run, they were all going to die. Despite pleas for another chance from Wang Chong and Huang Tian Fong, I coldly silenced them with bullets. No emotion showed on my face as I methodically approached the last one standing, Chin Leng, who was utterly terrified. She begged for her life, claiming she had a family to take care of, but I knew there could be no mercy. Like an avalanche, once it starts, no snowflake is innocent. I couldn't leave any threats behind. Surveying the aftermath, I felt nothing. After my rebirth, I had grown accustomed to the cycle of life and death. If not for the arsenal I had prepared in an alternate space, I might have been the one lying on the ground. As I prepared to leave, a faint voice reached my ears, it was Uncle Yu. 
I hurried to his side in disbelief. How was he still alive after taking three bullets? I wondered. Quickly, I retrieved an adrenaline shot from my alternate space and injected it into his chest. I spotted two neighbors sneakily watching, so I yelled, what are you staring at? Help me. Startled by the commotion, they quickly responded, coming, coming. Following my instructions, they brought Uncle Yu to my home on a stretcher. Meanwhile, Sia Lime, known for her cunning ways, rushed over with a distressed look. Seeing Uncle Yu unconscious, she burst into tears, lamenting how he had played the hero and left them behind. Sheila, veins bulging with anger, snapped at her to stop mourning, insisting that Uncle Yu was not dead and she would do everything to save him. I assured them that Dr. Joe, the chief doctor at the city hospital, would know what to do. Despite Sia Lime's tears, she continued to express her despair, mentioning her daughter's future and hoping I could take care of her. Confused by her premature arrangements, I questioned her, catching her off guard. She hastily explained that while she hoped for the best, it was wise to be prepared for the worst, though deep down, she saw Uncle Yu as her ticket to a comfortable life. When Uncle Yu was brought to my home, I suggested that Sia Lime and the others leave so Dr. Joe could perform surgery. However, Sia Lime, feigning concern, insisted she needed to stay by his side. Reluctantly, I agreed, knowing that despite the circumstances, Uncle Yu had saved my life and I couldn't drive away the woman he cared for. As warmth filled the house, Sia Lime shed tears of emotion, grateful for the comfort and fresh food. Anyone walking in would feel like staying forever. Soon enough, Selim made herself at home, heading straight to the kitchen for a cup of hot water. Dr. Joe and I exchanged speechless glances. She really thinks this is her place. Flush with excitement, Celine asked, do you have any milk powder? I want to prepare a warm bottle for the baby. Infuriated by her audacity, I snapped, don't you have your own milk? Are you seriously treating this place as your own, using Uncle Yu as a shield? Celine May retorted, the baby needs to eat. Old Yu adores the baby. Coldly, I responded, cut the nonsense. Either help out or leave. Without another word, I headed to the generator room, storing everything inside my spatial dimension. Then, I retrieved a white foldable bed from the same dimension, converting the area into a makeshift operating room. Celine watched in astonishment. Damn, Zhang Yi, are you performing magic or what? Ignoring her, I turned to Dr. Zhou. Tell me whatever medicines and medical equipment you need. I'll provide whatever I can. We must save Uncle Yu, no matter what. Dr. Zhou, being the chief doctor at the city hospital, certainly knew her stuff. But first, she had to assess Uncle Yu's injuries. As she removed his shirt, her brow furrowed in concern. The bullet's location suggested potential internal organ damage. Given the current medical conditions, it seemed impossible to save Uncle Yu. Upon hearing the grim prognosis, Celine may put on a theatrical display of tears. If old Yu goes, how will my daughter and I survive? I pointed at her angrily. Stop with the theatrics. If your crying affects Uncle Yu's surgery, then you might as well go to hell and join him in mourning. Understand? At my words, Celine may wiped her tears then I should probably leave. My presence here is only adding to the chaos. Yet internally, she thought, it's much more comfortable outside with hot water and food. Why would I want to stay in here? However, I quickly blocked her path. Just a moment ago, you said you wouldn't leave Uncle Yu's side. And now you think you're a hindrance? Listen closely. You'll stay right here and assist where needed. Even if you're just watching, it'll be an encouragement for Uncle Yu. If you dare step out of this room, you'll face the consequences, I warned sternly before turning away and striding towards the first floor hall. There, a group of neighbors attempted to justify their non-involvement in the attempted murder, but I had no patience for their excuses. Some had betrayed us, leading to Uncle Yu's critical injuries. They would pay for their treachery, but our immediate priority was launching a counterattack. Those not participating would be deemed traitors and face consequences akin to the dead bodies outside. As I delivered this warning, expressions of unease spread across the neighbors' faces. The sheer number of residents in the complex was intimidating, making their small group seem insignificant in comparison. I pointed to the combat supplies and instructed them to guard the exits and monitor the surroundings. Anyone attempting to flee should be dealt with swiftly. I would personally handle those inside the building, ensuring they learn the consequences of crossing me. Our group arrived at the base of building number 21. Meanwhile, Wolfgang and his crew on the upper floors had noticed my leadership and were already trembling in fear. In this post-apocalyptic world, where most only possessed melee weapons, I could effortlessly wield a submachine gun. Despite this, there were still those bold enough to defy me, this building was their territory, after all. The dimly lit hallways made firearms less effective, so I instructed my men to watch all the exits to prevent anyone from escaping. Approaching building number 21 alone, 
I first reached the ground floor hall. After ensuring it was empty, I retrieved a large pile of wood and clothing from my alternate space, placing them in various corners of the hall. Pouring gasoline over everything, I connected all the materials with trails of gasoline. With a flick of my lighter, I remarked, given how cold it is outside, let's warm things up a bit for these fellows, before tossing the lighter onto the gasoline. Flames quickly spread throughout the ground floor, and I calmly exited the scene. Wolfgang's crew, waiting for me to ascend, soon realized something was amiss as the fire grew more intense. Cursing my name, they realized it was Zangi and his gang who had set the place on fire. They rushed to open the windows to avoid suffocation from the smoke, but they found them frozen shut by the extreme cold. Without tools, they couldn't break through. By then, I had calmly walked out of the ground floor hall. Pointing to the smoke engulfed building behind me, I declared, the rest is up to you all. Be thorough and don't let a single one escape. Emotionlessly, I stared at the towering inferno. Under the force of hunger and desperation, these people would eventually turn their weapons towards me. They only had their incompetent leader to blame for provoking someone they shouldn't have. As the flames intensified, many couldn't endure the scorching heat and chose to leap from the balconies, crashing heavily into the snow below. Even if they weren't burned alive, the fall likely crippled them. With one leading the charge, more and more residents started jumping. Some from lower floors survived their falls, but little did they realize they had jumped from the frying pan into the fire. A woman from the crowd, who typically wouldn't even kill a chicken, wasted no time plunging her knife into the body of an old neighbor she used to spend her days with. Amidst the shock reactions, Leon only smiled and said, we all have to do what it takes to survive. I can't be left behind. As more people jumped from building 21, Leon hastily moved forward, eager to ensure no one else would claim her credit. Watching the raging fire, not a shred of pity crossed my heart. Wang Chan's building 21 was doomed. Every day, I provided them with food and cigarettes, and they plotted to kill me from the shadows. They shouldn't blame me for my merciless retaliation. In other buildings, many residents witnessed this horrifying spectacle. Their hearts raced with anxiety, fearing I might use the same method against them. Despite Wang Chan's prolonged plotting, his fate was riddled with bullet holes. However, many clung to the hope that they'd be spared since they hadn't participated in the assassination. They believed I had no reason to wipe them out. Having dealt with Building 21, I led my people towards Building 26, headed by Wan Tianfan. Seeing our approach, the residents of Building 26 frantically tried to distance themselves from the situation. This is all Wan Tianfang's doing, they exclaimed. We've got nothing to do with this, Zhang Yi, so please don't wrongly accuse the innocent. When I heard their pleas, I couldn't help but laugh. You claim this has nothing to do with you? I, for one, don't believe that. And you dare call yourselves good people? To have survived this long, each one of you must have taken a few lives. Without further ado, I repeated the process and gave Building 26 its own barbecue treatment. Soon, residents from other buildings grew restless, fearing I might go on a rampage and burn every structure in sight. However, to their surprise, I pulled out a megaphone from my pocket and addressed everyone. Listen up, everyone. There's no need to worry. While I, Zhang Yi, may not be a saint, I won't kill without reason. Anyone who treats me with friendliness will be spared. A wave of relief washed over the faces of many residents as they finally saw hope of survival. Yet, some remain skeptical. This had nothing to do with us in the first place. I don't believe he could possibly burn down the entire complex, they murmured. Ignoring their doubts, I instructed everyone to rest. But these neighbors refused to leave after enduring the cold for so many months, they weren't going to pass up a chance to warm themselves by the fire. Then, I approached the bodies of the two spies. It puzzled me, they had once been utterly loyal. What made them betray me? Rummaging through their belongings, I found their phones. Upon reviewing their chat history, realization dawned on me. So that's how it is. After dealing with the buildings involved in the assassination, I immediately returned to my safe house. The steady rhythm on the heart rate monitor indicated that Uncle Yu was out of danger. I smiled at Joe. It's no wonder you're the city's lead surgeon. Not everyone could have saved Uncle Yu like you did. As Dr. Joe and I chatted, Klima approached, holding her child. Zhang Yi, could you get something for me and my baby to eat? We've been hungry all day. It dawned on me that the surgery had taken over 10 hours. We should treat our great Dr. Joe here, I said, pulling out a pack of instant noodles from my pocket. Your uncle owes you a meal, so I won't let you go hungry. Then, I headed out for a meal with Dr. Joe, but Sialine persisted. Zhang Yi, do you have anything else to eat? I saw some eggs and chicken legs in the kitchen earlier. I was nearly boiling with frustration. This tricky girl always wanted more. If it weren't for Uncle Yu, I would have thrown her out without a second thought. 
It's the end of the world, I said bluntly, holding up the pack of noodles like it was pure gold. Eat it or leave it. After our meal, Dr. Joe and I returned to the bedroom. She noticed the tension in the air. Our house has another hassle, I tried to reassure her while massaging her tired muscles. Don't worry, she won't stay long. Then, I inquired about Uncle Yu's condition. Dr. Joe responded with a mysterious tone. By all logic, Uncle Yu shouldn't have survived with so much blood loss. But just as his heart rate was fading, something strange happened, his wounds began to visibly heal. I was stunned. Could it be that Uncle Yu has awakened some special ability? My own spatial ability had manifested because of the supernova explosion, but what puzzled me was why I was the only one in our community to awaken an ability. A sudden realization hit me. Uncle Yu's near-death state mirrored mine from before. Could that be the condition to awaken such abilities? If so, that's quite stringent. Luckily for Uncle Yu, he ran into me, otherwise, he'd need an ability to resurrect on the spot, or else death would be the only outcome. Thinking of this, I patted Dr. Joe's shoulder. From now on, administer a dose of sedative to Uncle Yu daily. Dr. Joe was taken aback. Did Uncle Yu awaken some sort of ability like you did? I nodded. It's unclear what Uncle Yu has awakened to, but if he turns into the Hulk and tears our home apart, it would be a major loss. After instructing Dr. Joe to administer the sedatives to Uncle Yu, I got up and headed to the living room. Meanwhile, Sialime was in the living room, scouting for something to eat. I sternly told her to stop looking. I've put everything away. You'll stay with Uncle Yu and be responsible for his daily needs. Seeing my serious demeanor, Sialime begrudgingly entered the room. What I had to do next was clear out any traitors in the building. I soon found myself fully armed in front of a door. Without hesitation, I shot through the lock and with a powerful kick burst open the door. A disheveled woman wielding a kitchen knife charged at me. I quickly raised a riot shield to block her attack, then slapped the knife out of her hand. It's been a long time. The fact you're still alive suggests you've turned your best friend into clay pot rice, haven't you? Fang Yeching's bloodshot eyes cried out hysterically. It's impossible. Why can't so many people kill just one of you? I chuckled in response. Did you really think colluding with Wan Chong and a few others would be enough to get rid of me? You're so naive. With that, I raised the wooden stick in my hand. Had it not been for this woman's meddling in my past life, I could have lived at least two more years. Thinking this, I viciously struck Fang Yeching's left leg with the stick. Next, I dragged her to the window, intending to throw her out. Seeing this, Fang Yeching was finally gripped with fear. Zhang Yi, please spare me. I realize my mistakes and promise never to repeat them. Thinking of the pain of being cannibalized in my past life, I didn't hesitate and let go, allowing Fang Yeching to plummet from the 25th floor. Accompanied by a loud thud, Fang Yeching smashed into the snowy ground, creating a deep crater. Watching the scene, I felt no pity. This was my revenge for my past life. The next morning, I went to the sick room to check on Uncle. Unexpectedly, after the transformation, Uncle's healing speed was dozens of times faster than a regular person's. In just a day, his gunshot wound had mostly healed. I instructed Dr. Joe to always monitor his condition to prevent any unexpected occurrences. Without hesitation, Dr. Joe immediately administered a sedative injection to Uncle. Just then, Climate approached, hoping I could go to her place to help retrieve her charger and diapers. I smiled, indicating that I had urgent matters to attend to, but I would assist her once I was done. After leaving the room, my expression immediately darkened. This scheming woman is still up to her old tricks. Our two families are only separated by a few floors, yet she still wants my help. Clearly, she fears that once she leaves, she won't be able to return. I need to find a way to deal with this cunning woman. Keeping her around will be a liability sooner or later. I headed to the residential area to continue my search for threats. Clearing these dangers was crucial for our safety in this post-apocalyptic world. Suddenly, Su Hao, a nervous wealthy second-generation kid, approached me with supposed vital information. I raised an eyebrow, having pretty much cleared out the entire compound already. But Su Hao insisted, whispering about the richest man's son, Wan Siming, supposedly building a multi-billion dollar safe house for the apocalypse. Intrigued, I asked for the location. Su Hao motioned for me to follow him discreetly, implying it wasn't safe to talk openly. At his residence, Su Hao hesitantly shared that the safe house was in Young Villa, rumored to be stocked with enough supplies for lifetimes. Confused, I asked his motive for telling me this. Su Hao claimed loyalty, wanting to be my subordinate and follow my lead. Skeptical, I chuckled at the idea of easily taking over such a valuable safe house. Su Hao then dropped a bombshell, Wang Simon was on to me and planned to ambush me with Caesar's snowmobile and supplies. Furious at the betrayal, I confronted Su Hao, 
who begged for forgiveness, claiming he now genuinely wanted to join me in capturing the safe house. With a gun in hand, I demanded proof of his sincerity. Su Hao pleaded for mercy, swearing his words were true. Despite his pleas, I remained cautious. As he trembled with fear, I holstered my gun, considering his offer but insisting he give me a solid reason to trust him. After witnessing your abilities, I realized that my only chance of survival in this post-apocalyptic world is by following you. Even if I allied myself with Juan Simon, I'd just be a disposable pawn in his eyes. Before the apocalypse, I was Juan Simon's lackey, trying to gain his favor. I even sacrificed my own woman for his amusement. But Juan Simon never treated me like a human being, which filled me with deep resentment. Seeing Su Hao's rage, I suggested that collaboration might be possible, but only with a solid plan. Su Hao proposed that we pretend to ally with Juan Simon until we're inside his compound, then eliminate him. Chuckling, I replied, are you an idiot? You want to take on someone without knowing their security details? Su Hao countered that he knew Juan Simon's security details, but there was a catch, I had to promise him a position as my subordinate, or he'd remain silent. Smirking, I pressed the muzzle of my gun against his forehead. Seeing this, Su Hao yelled, I know you'll silence anyone who's no longer useful, but information about that safe house is my only lifeline now. Even if it kills me, I won't reveal it. Impressed, I remarked, you're pretty clever. I'll accept your terms, but you must abide by my rules. Su Hao nodded rapidly, swearing his loyalty to me and promising to always follow my orders. I then laid out my conditions. First, he had to provide a detailed account of the safe house, and second, he had to deal with a particular nuisance for me, Song. After securing Su Hao's loyalty, I didn't immediately give him my request. Instead, I mentioned that as my subordinate, I had something valuable to bestow upon him. Then, I returned to my safe house. Soon after, I arrived at Su Hao's residence holding a briefcase. Slowly, I began, since you've chosen to be my subordinate, there are certain truths I won't hide from you. I am, in fact, a professional assassin. Understanding dawned on Su Hao. No wonder, Brother Zhang Yi, your shooting skills are impeccable. Su Hao's confidence in the future grew. He believed that as long as he remained by my side, he would surely survive in this post-apocalyptic world. At that moment, I pulled out a syringe from the briefcase. This is a slow-acting poison I specifically use for those who are stubborn or have ill intentions. Without an antidote, death is inevitable within a month. Upon hearing this, Su Hao shouted in panic. I reassured Zhang Yi with a smile, promising him that I had no bad intentions. Don't worry, I said, as soon as we take down Wan Simon's safe house, I'll give you the antidote right away. Su Hao collapsed upon hearing this. He knew that if they didn't succeed, he'd die. Without hesitation, I injected the substance into his neck, binding him to me. I told him not to worry, assuring him that the poison wouldn't activate until the right time. Watching him walk away trembling, I smirked, knowing I had successfully intimidated him. With his fear of tap water, the chances of betrayal were slim. Meanwhile, in a hospital room, Uncle had just regained consciousness. Sea Lime whispered in his ear, but I had been watching the scene through surveillance. I opened the door, pretending to be surprised at Uncle's awakening. Uncle, you're finally awake, I exclaimed. He gratefully thanked me, saying his life now belonged to me. Chuckling, I told him it was thanks to him this time. Sea Lime joined in, expressing gratitude. I assured them that we were now one family and would take care of them. Seattle May's face lit up with joy, knowing they could stay without worries. She handed me the baby she was holding and left to get their belongings. As soon as she was gone, I sent a message to Su Ao, prepare for action. While playing with the baby, I couldn't help but think about how tough it must be for such a little one. But it's for the best, I thought. Otherwise, someone might end up turning you into a stew one day. Meanwhile, Salim's smile returned as she reached her door. But as she opened it, Su Hao suddenly lunged at her. Before she could even react, he swiftly stabbed her in desperation. Salim begged for mercy, promising to give him whatever he wanted. But Su Hao didn't stop his attack until she was motionless. Afterward, he texted me, saying, Brother Zhang Yi, it's done. When can I get some food? Seeing the message, I couldn't help but smile. Finally, this problem was resolved. Otherwise, she might have caused discord between Uncle Yu and me. Turning to Uncle Yu, I said, your family can stay here in peace. Whenever you wish to move out, you're free to do so. He looked troubled upon hearing my words. Brother Zhang Yi, this might not be appropriate, he said, plus, resources are limited. Saving my life is more than enough. I patted his shoulder reassuringly. We've already been through life and death together. Just stay here and recover. However, before I could finish, the baby in my arms began to cry uncontrollably. 
Despite my best efforts, I couldn't calm the little one down. In desperation, I handed the baby to Dr. Joe, who appeared completely lost. Suddenly, a thought struck me. Could it be time for a diaper change? I quickly took out a pack of diapers from my storage space and tossed it to Dr. Joe. Then, I returned to Uncle Yu's room to inquire about his condition, asking if he felt anything amiss. Uncle Yu shook his head, indicating that apart from feeling weak, he didn't notice any other abnormalities. Suddenly, as if recalling something, he said, Zhang Yi, you should check outside. My wife has been gone for quite a while. I'm worried something might have happened to her. I instructed Joe to look after Uncle Yu, and I went to my room to arm myself. Taking this opportunity, I planned to deal with some pending matters. I then sent a message to all the homeowners, summoning them to room 1301 on the 13th floor. The meeting was meant to distribute resources and decide on the future management of the community. We had taken control of the entire area, and now our word was law, except for Sue. When the neighbors rushed to room 1301 after receiving the message, I couldn't help but smirk. Want to be the community's manager? Talk to the king of hell about that. Without hesitation, I threw two grenades into the room. The unsuspecting neighbors, mid-conversation, were shocked by the sight of the grenades. What the hell is this? They exclaimed. But before they could react, a massive explosion tore through the room. I had already positioned a blast shield outside to protect myself. Walking into the room, looking contemplative, I thought to myself, using grenades really makes things easier. A surviving neighbor, filled with rage, shouted, Zhang Yi. We helped you so much. Why are you doing this? I responded with a cold smirk. You might be mistaken. Without me, you would have starved to death long ago. Without another word, I made sure he joined the others in the afterlife. Having exacted my revenge, I felt an immense sense of satisfaction. Except for Su Hao, all the neighbors who had wronged me in my previous life had been dealt with. From now on, no one in this community would ever pose a threat to me. All I needed now was to get to Wong Simon's billion dollar safe house, and then I could live the rest of my days in peace and luxury. With a mournful expression, I approached Uncle Yu. Sister Sia, she's gone. I slammed my fist against the wall. I thought there were only a few traitors in this building, but it turns out they were all traitors. But don't worry, Uncle Yu, I've taken care of them all in revenge for Sister Sia. Upon hearing this, tears streamed down Uncle Yu's face. Those ungrateful bastards deserved it, he said angrily, throwing a fierce punch at his bed, creating a deep dent. This display of strength sent shivers down my spine. I tried to calm Uncle Yu. It's my fault for being too trusting. If only I had noticed their true intentions earlier. Uncle Yu clenched his fists, completely believing my words. After all, he too had witnessed the ingratitude of these neighbors over time. It's all my fault for not managing things properly, I sighed. But Uncle Yu, don't be too devastated. I promise to find you a young and beautiful wife. Upon hearing my words, Uncle Yu gave an awkward smile. I'd prefer someone mature. Just then, Joe walked in with a crying baby. This little one can't stop crying. What should we do? I glanced at Joe, pondering if the baby might be hungry for milk. Dr. Joe lightly punched my chest, questioning my suggestion. What are you talking about? How would I have milk to feed the baby? Taking the baby from her, I realized we might need to find a stepmother for this little one. He agreed with my idea, after all, neither of us had experience with kids, and it would be terrible if something went wrong. A moment later, I headed downstairs to the community with the baby, alarming the nearby residents. They whispered among themselves, wondering if I, Zhang Yi, was coming to cause trouble. I pointed my gun to the sky and shouted, bring out Legion. Shortly after, Legion emerged from building 18 and asked me what I wanted. I smiled at him, impressed by his guts. Aren't you afraid I'll shoot you on the spot? To my surprise, despite the post-apocalyptic environment where food and clothes were scarce, building 18 under Li Jin's management had the highest number of survivors. I couldn't help but respect that. I handed the baby over to Li. Are there mothers in your building, right? I'm entrusting you with the baby's care. As I said this, I placed some baby formula and diapers in front of Li. Without much ado, Li assured me he would do his best to raise the baby. He then handed the baby over to a mother in building 18 to take care of. I approached Li Jin, inquiring about the exact number of survivors in their building and what they would do if I stopped providing them with food. But Li Chen was full of hope for the future, no matter what. As long as people are alive, there's always hope. Upon hearing this, I pointed to the buildings I had cleared out. The supplies there should last you for a while. However, Li shook his head, indicating that they would not resort to that unless absolutely necessary. In his view, once they start down that path, their ultimate fate would be doom a conclusion neither he nor anyone in his building wanted to see. 
Hearing this, I sighed deeply. With everything as it is now, nobody knows if death or tomorrow will come first. Yet this man manages to hold on to his core values. I couldn't help but admire him greatly. Li Jin took a deep breath. If only we were as capable as you. Maybe then I could truly lead everyone out of this apocalypse. So, Zhang Yi, can you lend a hand a bit more? You've been able to provide a lot of food for the whole community before. With so many people gone now, your help could really make a difference for those of us still here. I interrupted him. Everyone is struggling right now. I'm not a saint. I might help you now, but can I keep doing it forever? And who's to say I won't face betrayal from those I've helped in this apocalypse? Just surviving is a blessing. I don't have grand ambitions of being a savior. I then tossed a few packs of seeds in front of Legion. Consider these a parting gift. If you want to thrive, you have to work for it. In this apocalyptic world, we're all in the dark, but I see a glimmer of humanity in you. You can lead everyone to cultivate these seeds and farm, or you can eat them now. It's your choice. With that, I turned around and walked away. The residents who picked up the seeds looked puzzled. Can we really grow crops in this frigid weather? At that moment, a professor from the agricultural college urged everyone to quickly secure the seeds. These are our future hope. Seeing this, Li Jin also hastily collected the seeds. He asked the professor, Professor, can we really grow crops in such cold conditions? With a determined look, the professor responded, Humanity has achieved countless impossibilities. Why can't we make it work this time? Hearing this, the other residents didn't hesitate any further, and with renewed hope, they gathered the seeds scattered on the ground. Back in my safe house, I stretched out. Finally, the community matters have come to a close. Next, I need to acquire Juan Simon's multi-billion safe house. I then asked Joe to prepare dinner. I've been busy all day, and I'm quite hungry. Without hesitation, Joe began cooking. As I watched her graceful figure, I approached her with a playful suggestion. How about we have a child? Who knows how long this apocalypse will last? Having kids is a way to ensure a legacy. Two hours later, I received a message from Su Hao. He had negotiated with Juan Simon and asked when we would initiate our plan. I smiled in response. No need to rush. Come to my place, and we'll discuss it. Soon after, Su Hao arrived at my safe house, clearly enjoying the warmth of my shelter. I motioned for him to sit down so we could discuss our plans. Su Hao was about to kneel on the floor to report the details of his conversation with Juan Simon when I made a silence gesture. No need to make it complicated. Just show me the chat history between you two. Upon hearing this, Su Hao broke into a cold sweat. Seeing that Su Hao was hesitant to bring out his phone, my smile vanished instantly. So reluctant. Are you hiding something from me? Su Hao clutched his phone tightly, stuttering, I. I haven't hidden anything from you. Growing impatient, I replied, is it so hard to have a proper conversation? Do I really have to get physical with you? Quickly handing over his phone, Su pleaded with me, saying, I did badmouth you to Wan Simming, but it was all a ploy to deceive him. I hope you won't take it personally, brother. I swiftly took the phone and scrolled through their chat history, discovering that Su had been in contact with Wan Simming for two months. Su initially wanted Wan Simming to eliminate me and then help him seize my safe house and supplies. Surprisingly, Wang Simon had similar intentions. With a cold laugh, I displayed the chat log to Su. How do you plan to explain this? You played both sides quite masterfully. Caught in the act, Su quickly raised his right hand, swearing, Brother, you've manipulated me too, right? We're two peas in a pod. Why would I betray you? I remained silent, rubbing my chin and thinking. Wang Simon only knew about my snowmobile and base, unaware of my arsenal. Perhaps I could exploit this intelligence gap to set a trap. Throwing the phone onto the table, I looked at Sue and said, tell me everything about that shelter, especially the weaponry and defenses. I want every detail. Relieved, Sue began, rumor has it that the shelter was built using materials from a spaceship. It's practically impenetrable unless attacked with missiles. Inside, there aren't any weapons, but there's gas used for hypnosis. The entrances are rigged with high-temperature flamethrowers. After hearing Sue's description, I formulated a plan in my mind. If he's after my vehicle and supplies, then if he doesn't get those things, even if he captures me, he probably won't kill me. At most, he'll torture me. When the time comes, I'll hide the snowmobile in advance, granting myself an extra layer of protection. Although my life may not be significant to him, I suspect he won't kill me before obtaining my snowmobile and supplies. Is there any other offensive mechanism inside that shelter apart from the two you mentioned? I asked. Grinning, Sue replied, that's all. We can pretend to be hypnotized by the gas, pass the traps, and then take him out once we're there. You can pretend to be captured, and I'll seize the chance to stab him, sending him straight to hell. 
the corners of my mouth lifted slightly. Sue probably didn't know I had a gas mask. That's all right, it's always smart to be cautious. I lay on the sofa, thinking about how to deal with both the flames and gas. Without the upper hand, I couldn't help but feel a bit uneasy. After much pondering, an idea popped into my mind, my space ability. Time is frozen within this otherworldly space. If I could use it in battle, wouldn't it be a powerful advantage? I had always overlooked this ability. It seems I need to explore it further. Su Hao sat on the ground eagerly awaiting my response. Finally, I said, all right, go back for now. I'll contact you in a couple of days. Su Hao clung to my leg, brother Zhang Yi, I've been poisoned. I'm afraid I can't wait that long, I reassured him, the poison takes seven days to take effect. I'll contact you in two or three days at most. Go home and wait patiently. No sooner had I spoken than I ushered him out the door. Brother Zhang Yi, you must remember, otherwise I'll be gone in seven days, Su Hao said before leaving. I looked at my special ability in my hand. Apart from storing supplies and precise shooting, I wondered what other surprising capabilities it might have. However, my primary concern was how to utilize this power to neutralize the flame and gas. Once that was sorted, I could easily control Juan Simon. I left the living room and entered an empty house, starting a fire to test my ability. Stretching out my right hand towards the flame, I activated my storage ability. The flames on the ground slowly converged towards me. Seeing that it worked, I extended both palms, aiming to accelerate the absorption process. In no time, the flames were entirely absorbed into the alternate space. I looked at my hands, delighted. I can't believe it actually worked, I said with a grin. I stretched my palms forward, intending to try and release distorted fire. With a whooshing sound, the flames I had absorbed were instantly expelled forward. My eyes widened in surprise, and I burst into joyful laughter. So, apart from storage, this alternate space can be used like this. It's like a divine defensive technique. I was as elated as a child who had discovered a new toy. Once I mastered this ability, any future attacks would be rendered useless against me. This power was perfect for someone like me who prioritizes survival above all else. So, I had this idea. What if I absorbed a living person into my alternate space? I mean, I tried it with a live fish before, but that was just for storing food. Now, I'm thinking about its combat potential. I needed to test it out with a real person. People around were scared, but they reluctantly offered up a sacrifice. The poor guy had no idea if he'd make it out alive. I handed him a stick and told him to attack me with it. He looked completely lost and scared, but he swung at me anyway. In a flash, I activated my alternate space. Before he knew it, he and the stick were sucked in. He froze in place, like he'd turned into an ice sculpture. I checked his pulse and, yep, he was out cold. With a wave of my hand, I ejected him from the space. Poor guy stumbled out, looking terrified. I asked him how it felt, and he said it was like entering a blank world. He felt like he'd been in there for ages, even though it was just a moment. I realized then that time moves differently in the alternate space. The longer you're in there, the worse it gets for your mind. Living things can't handle it for too long without serious consequences. They could end up dead or seriously messed up. Since I couldn't actively absorb living beings into my alternate space, I wondered what would happen if I tried to disassemble some tissues instead. I immediately grabbed my sacrifice neighbor's hand and swiftly sliced off two of his fingers. He screamed in agony, sounding like a pit being slaughtered, but I didn't care about his well-being. I was more intrigued by the discovery that while living beings couldn't stay in the alternate space for long, severed fingers could. What could be the principle behind this? I tossed some gauze to the man. Hurry up and bandage yourself. Once you're done, we'll continue the experiment. This time, you'll throw something at me. After several more experiments using the man as a test subject, I had a better grasp of the functionalities of my alternate space. Until now, I had merely used it as a storage facility, which was a waste. My power could open a channel between this world and the alternate space to deflect incoming attacks and then redirect them back at my enemies. The man was now voraciously enjoying the food I had rewarded him with as he gorged himself. Excitedly, he thanked me. This is the first full meal I've had since the apocalypse. I smiled at him and said, eat slowly, brother. The man's spirits lifted at this. Brother Zhang Yi, if you need anything, just say the word. As long as you feed me, he added before I could finish his sentence. I made a quick move, and the man collapsed on the ground with a thud, blood pooling around him. I smiled and said, I don't need anything else from you. You should be on your way now. The man on the ground closed his eyes with a smile. He was finally free, no longer having to endure hunger and suffering in this post-apocalyptic world. Without looking back, I walked away. Time was running out for my appointment with Su Hao, 
and in the next few days, I needed to find some people for combat simulations. Three days later, Su Hao was kneeling in front of me, begging me to join the attack on Wan Siming Sanctuary. Ever since Xiang Yi had forcibly injected him with poison, he felt his body deteriorating day by day. If we didn't act soon, he feared he would die before we could see Swan Simon's stronghold. I looked at Su Hao coldly, finding the situation amusing. I hadn't expected that a lie I casually made up would have such a devastating effect on him. The power of psychological suggestion had certainly tormented him. Shrugging, I said, I can inject you with an antidote to temporarily relieve your symptoms. If there's no cure in five days, you will die regardless. I can't wait any longer, Su Hao urgently said, rolling up his sleeves. If I don't get the shot, I feel like I'll die tomorrow. Administered the injection, he continued his psychological manipulation. We can only succeed, failure will not bode well for either of us. Filled with newfound confidence, Su Ao said, Brother Zhang Yi, rest assured, I'm willing to go through fire and water for you. Su Ao took out his phone. I'll call Wan Simon right now to arrange a meeting time. Everything will go according to your plan, Brother Zhang Yi. Zhang Yi started packing his bags. Dr. Zhou, standing nearby, watched in a daze. The issues in their community had mostly been resolved, and she couldn't understand why they needed to go out again, especially with so much luggage. It seemed like they were going on a long trip. Zhang Yi had left enough food for her and Uncle Yu to last half a month but didn't share details of his plan. Shocked, Dr. Zhou didn't dare to ask more questions. Just as Zhang Yi was about to leave, Dr. Zhou grew anxious. Was he planning to abandon her? She hugged him tightly, refusing to let go. Chuckling, Zhang Yi pinched her chin. Looks like the silly girl is overthinking things. If it weren't for more pressing matters, I would have stayed and spent more time with Dr. Joe. Suppressing his emotions, he kissed her and told her to behave while he was away. Their lives would undergo significant changes once he accomplished his current mission. With that, he walked out the door. Su Ao had been waiting for some time. Zhang Yi hopped onto his snowmobile and pulled out a rope. Su Ao was puzzled. Brother Zhang Yi, you still don't trust me? My loyalty to you is as clear as daylight. Zhang Yi smiled. Don't misunderstand. I'm tying you up for Wan Siming to see. If he sees us getting along too well, he'd never believe that you've tricked me into this. Su Ao could only helplessly stretch out his hands as Zhang Yi tied him up. They rode away on the snowmobile, the northern wind painfully whipping Su Ao's face. He wanted to ask Zhang Yi for a helmet, but Zhang Yi chuckled. No helmet for you. Just endure it for a bit. Besides, the more miserable you look, the more believable it will be. Sniffling heavily, Su Ao followed Zhang Yi. Tiank Mountain Villa loomed ahead. Zhang looked at the luxurious villas inside, facing the river and backed by the mountains. These buildings are a cut above other high-end villas. The terrain makes this place a natural snow haven. The snow accumulation here is much less than other places. When the apocalypse came, I thought the wealth gap would shrink. How naive I was. Money really is great, Su Ao hardly chimed in from behind. Brother Zhang Yi, money is like waste paper now. Our current lives can't compare to yours. Zhang Yi smiled. Nice flattery. Come on, lead the way. The two then headed towards the villa complex. Su Ao was a bit puzzled as he followed, wondering why they didn't ride the snowmobile all the way in. Zhang ignored his question and simply said, We're walking. That's it. Stop talking. With this, the chapter concludes. Don't miss out on the next installment. Hit that subscribe button.